So I'm Brett Nelson. I'm seeing mostly emergency physicians in the audience, so um, I'll just take out all the cardiology slides that I had. I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, emergency point of care cardiac ultrasound. So those first couple of caveats, how we approach things in the emergency department is a little bit different, as we heard some uh, suggestion of uh, in the previous talk. How we approach point of care ultrasound is different than consultative ultrasound and uh, the kind of the kind that they do in an echo lab, for example. So I want to talk about what we do, how we do it, and uh, a little bit about why we do it. Uh, you guys probably already know that you can reach me on Twitter or you can just raise your hand and just ask me if there's questions. We're all among friends here. So um, there's not a lot of time, so I can't talk about the past too much. In the past, there was no cardiac ultrasound. We had to use regular sound, and we were happy to have it. So we would actually use these tubes that we would attach one end to the patient, and we would attach the other end into our ears, and we would have to listen to regular audible sound. If you ask the librarians at Levy Library, they will uh, show you our collection of historical uh, stethoscopes and stethophones, uh, which is really cool, some of the stuff like Linek designed. And if you ask your faculty or some of your colleagues, they actually carry replicas of this equipment with them on shift, uh, just as a reminder of uh, the golden age of, uh, of evidence-based medicine. So, um, so that's very helpful as well. So where are we in the present? Well, in the present, we're almost at the point where we've got an ultrasound in everyone's hand. Um, I think you know that we're spoiled that we have eight, or at the moment, seven ultrasound <laughs> machines available to us uh, in our emergency department. Um, you, it, it's, it's, it's nice to be essentially tripping over these. There are handheld devices that run off um, that run off of uh, you know, Samsung or Galaxy uh, tablets or even phones that are available through a multitude of different companies. More and more of them are coming on the market. Um, starting this year and a couple more companies next year are going to have basically handheld wireless devices that communicate through Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to a handheld device that you already own. So we're starting to reach uh, this level of disruption in this innovation where you can have uh, a device that you might choose to make a personal purchase with instead of the, the pioneers uh, making individual purchase of these devices. So among the disruptions in this is that everyone has the capacity to do ultrasound uh, at the bedside, cardiac and otherwise. And um, emergency medicine, as you guys should know, uh, has had ultrasound written into its core curriculum since the mid-1990s. It's been written into explicit ASAP ultrasound guidelines since 2001, and those were revamped in 2008 and again most recently in 2016. So there's several decades of history of emergency physicians using point-of-care ultrasound, again, cardiac and otherwise. But cardiac was among the first indications that we did. Medical students around the country are learning to use this technology as well. So all the techniques I'm going to describe to you guys, most of which hopefully you know already, um, are exactly the curriculum that our own medical students are getting. They're getting it as part of their physical examination course. They're getting it as part of their intro to internship capstone course, which is made up of skills for internship. So the idea that nearly every physician in nearly every specialty will make use of point-of-care ultrasound as they move forward in the, their careers in this day is, uh, is very powerful. And folks at UC Irvine and Ohio State and Wayne State, University of South Carolina, Sinai, and other places have really pushed this forward. And it's not quite the standard yet, but it's becoming so. And this is one of the studies that people tend to quote on this. It's by Koba et al. back in 2005. So again, not hot off the press, fresh news. And it is a bit of a straw man setup where if you train first year medical students in the use of cardiac ultrasound and pit their physical examination skills using that cardiac ultrasound against cardiology fellows armed only with those rubber tubes, the ability to detect left ventricular uh, pathology, right ventricular pathology, uh, valve pathology, contractility disorders are all much greater in those first year medical students. So even using a simple technique and a simple tool, uh, when you use it effectively, it can be incredibly powerful. So everything I'm about to talk about really falls under the rubric of basic ultrasound. We're gonna talk about using cardiac ultrasound, looking at the actual heart, and then the impact of the heart on the lungs and the IVC. 
So the main thing we tend to look for when we're looking at cardiac ultrasound is contractility, the amount of squeeze that we're getting out of the heart. And there's a lot of uh, very complex, three-dimensional uh, biometric modeling analysis that can be done, or you can just sort of eyeball it. So if you just sort of eyeball this subxiphoid four-chamber view, and we can see all four chambers represented pretty well, right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium, we can see that the chamber is squeezing reasonably well. We can also see, by the way, that there's no effusion. If that's all we're starting with, that's actually, again, very powerful, and it's not enormously complicated. If I switch this up to a parasternal long axis view where we can see the right ventricle anteriorly, septum, left ventricle, mitral valve, left atrium, aortic outflow tract, we can see three things that we look for for cardiac contractility. One of them is that the left ventricle itself is squeezing pretty well. So that quick gestalt about the amount of chamber squeeze is the first thing we look at. The next thing we look at is the septum in the posterior wall, and is it thickening as it contracts? Every muscle in the body should thicken as it contracts. So that's a, a double check on your contractility. And finally, we look here at that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Since we have a closed circulatory system where the amount of fluid running into the ventricle should equal the amount of fluid coming out of the ventricle, the valve opening wide open means that a lot of blood rushed in during diastole which means a lot of blood came out during systole. So the separation of the septum during the E point of the cardiac cycle, the filling phase, the diastole, is a good metric for how well the cart is contracting. So the separation of the septum during the E point of the cardiac cycle is known as E point septal separation, or EPSS. That should be within seven millimeters, but you guys have seen a lot of examples already in your practice, I hope, that most normal patients, it's practically touching. So, squeeze, thickening with contraction, wide open mitral valve are all the three things we look for to get a gestalt for normal contractility. How's this contractility? There's no contractility. There's what we call auto contrast here, right? And we can have an awesome debate about whether that represents micro, micro bubbles or micro clots. It doesn't matter because it's not moving. Um, so that's the second kind of contractility. There's only four that I care that you know about. Normal, we saw already. Asystole or sonographic asystole has a very good prognostic value during cardiac arrest, as I'm sure you know. How's this contractility look? Hyperdynamic. So now we've got three out of four possibilities, right? So there's definitely thickening with contraction. The mitral valve is really sort of slapping the septum. The cardiac chamber is almost obliterated. So this is a higher than normal ejection fraction, okay? And then how about this one? Poor contractility, hypocontractile, depressed ejection fraction. Uh, there's a large chamber, very little contractility, anterior or posterior. The mitral valve leaflets aren't going very far at all. Um, this is depressed contractility. Again, this is a gestalt. If you remember from medical school, learning during your psychiatry rotation, that if you speak with a patient and you start to feel depressed, they might likely have a diagnosis of depression themselves. So when I look at this, I feel the same way. So it's a gestalt about the appearance of the chamber, okay? It's, rare, it's really rare that it's going to be clinically relevant for us to know the difference between a 55% ejection fraction and a 50% ejection fraction, okay? It's very relevant to see this patient's hyperdynamic, this patient is dead. That's a, good, that's a good binary right there. And then we've got normal and depressed. So if we go from dead, depressed, normal, and hypercontractile, and we can put people in those four broad categories, it's already enormously powerful, despite that it seems like I'm oversimplifying it to the point of absurdity, okay? One last thing. Usually I'm supposed to start with this. If this is going to be a sexy cardiac talk, I'm supposed to start with tamponade, right? Because the patient's hypotensive and tachycardic. You see the tamponade. You're getting needles out. It's very exciting. Um, so remember this sub-xiphoid four-chamber view? So I should see four chambers, right? Right atrium, no right ventricle. Left ventricle, left atrium is kind of hiding down there. So um, some people describe early tamponade as, as sort of a wiggling appearance of the... Um, 
the anterior wall of the, of the right ventricle, the free wall of the right ventricle, um, or that someone's jumping up and down on a trampoline. This, to me, looks like someone jumped on the trampoline, and either they're too big or the trampoline's too small, and it didn't rebound whatsoever. So there's basically no right ventricular filling here. So this is the obvious case where we see the sort of missing ventricle syndrome. I just made that up. That's not a real syndrome. I have to be careful about what I, what I say. Um, and it's probably some pediatric thing, so I don't want to confuse anybody. So... Um, so here, we see another example of tamponade. This is sort of a sonographic doorway diagnosis, right? You're busy scanning somebody in there. Jim Sung walks by, you know, because he heard the ultrasound waves happening, in the, and, and, and he sees, you know, this uh, appearance. So what do you think this EKG looks like? What do you think the QRS complexes look like? Alternates, right? Up and down and up and down. And this is, this is one of the reasons, one of many, why I have such respect for cardiology, right? Way before there was echo, there was EKG. So a cardiologist looks at an EKG, and they see this pulsus alternans sort of situation happening, and they're like, you know what I bet's happening? I'll bet there's fluid around the heart, and it's swinging back and forth. Like, how, think, it's so easy for us to make this diagnosis, right? All of our second-year medical students could, could do this because they have their, you know, their ultrasound machines. But you know, being able to use an EKG to get it, it's, it's harder, very impressive. So anyway, we can find that as well. So the, the heart stuff, again, even if we keep it simple, and we just boil it down to effusion and tamponade and levels of cardiac contractility in only those four categories, that's already very powerful. If we want to use an analogy of physical examination, we don't only examine the heart when we examine a patient. We want to see the impact of the heart on the lungs. And sometimes using the lungs as that canary in the coal mine can give us a sense of how well the heart is functioning and whether this is compensated or decompensated. Okay? Because you know plenty of patients we see every day have terrible cardiac contractility, but they're breathing well. Their lungs have not filled up with fluid. They're not decompensated congestive heart failure. They're, they're compensated. So looking at the inferior vena cava is one way that we can do this. This is the sonographic equivalent of looking for jugular venous distension or looking for peripheral uh, edema. So um, in a longitudinal view, where we see the head, patient's head is over here, heart is here, right ventricle's here, the um, RV inlet, uh, the uh, right atrial inlet here from the inferior vena cava, and then we're extending down towards the feet here. There's the liver. So what vein is this? One of the hepatic veins, right? So right around where the hepatic veins come into the IVC, that's the area that we want to look. And we want to look at a diameter, and depending on who you read, it should, the, 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 the marker is 2.1 or 2.5 centimeters. And we want to look for collapsibility during respirations. And in a normally spontaneously breathing patient, we want to see a 50% collapse, and that would suggest that they could handle more fluid. So as uh, described in Journal of American Society for Echo in 2010, uh, here, and I like this reference, I'm going to get back to why I like this reference in a minute, there's this great table, right? If you have an IVC diameter of less than 2.1 centimeters, so a small IVC, and it's collapsing by greater than 50%, the estimated right atrial pressure is 3 millimeters of mercury. In the other extreme, you look at greater than 2.1 centimeters with a 50% change in diameter, and now we've got a right atrial pressure that's elevated. When you get a mixed picture, it's much harder to interpret. It's probably somewhere in the middle, 8 millimeters, when it's either uh, not changing, but it's small, or it's changing a lot, but it's big. It's kind of harder to say what that means. The reason I like this reference is um, it's easy to use a cardiology reference on the heart and the IVC, which is attached to the heart, and make it seem like that's what it is. The reality is all the individual studies looking at IVC alone for fluid responsiveness, volume status, are only, yeah. They don't write it that way because you can't really spell, yeah, but it's only okay. So. Um, putting them all together and, you know, packaging them in a nice pretty table with numbers on it, to me, is a gross oversimplification. It's helpful to think in general that a person with a small IVC that's changing in diameter probably has a low end atrial pressure, and someone with a fat IVC that's not moving, a plethora, uh, is probably on the high end. Um, but I don't like to use this as a metric on its own. When would I ever look at an IVC and not the heart, right? So I want to see what these things are doing in tandem, how they relate to each other. Just like you see people who are, have edema, 
but their heart's functioning normally, right? So it's just one piece of the puzzle. So here's an IVC that is dilated. It's probably getting up on three centimeters, and during normal respirations, there is well less than 50% collapse. I generally eyeball this. Uh, you guys have seen me measure things with my fingers on the screen, right? If I really care and it's close, I'll measure it. I'll take the calipers, measure its widest diameter and its narrowest diameter, and actually measure it, okay? Um, I don't like using M mode because if you drop an M mode line through the appropriate part of the inferior vena cava, when the patient starts to breathe, the IVC moves. So you're really measuring this part of the IVC during inspiration and that part of the IVC during expiration, which isn't how you measure things, right? You want to measure the same thing during the respiratory cycle so you can just freeze it in one spot versus the other, okay? Um, again, most of the time if, I'm, if I am measuring it, it's that close, it becomes less useful for me. Right? Because it's, I'm not sure if it's going 50% or not, then it's not clearly in one of those easy categories of big versus small. In contrast, we have this patient who is tachycardic and hypotensive, and their IVC is totally collapsing. Or is it? What, what's a technique issue that could cause this appearance? Getting off plane. That's kind of what you guys, I think, were saying in aggregate. Yeah, so, so if you look at... <laughs> <laughs> if you look at a tube in cross-section, okay, and you're slicing a plane through it, and if you see it collapsing, that's, that's what's really happening. The other thing that could happen is you're going off the side because either your hand is moving or the patient who might be in the extremis is, is you know, heaving as they breathe, so they're sliding you off the side. So it's going to look the same for you to slice a plane through a cylinder if you're sliding off the edge of it, it's going to get bigger and smaller, or if it's collapsing, it's going to get bigger and smaller. So how do you check that? If you're in this plane, what can you do to check it? Switch planes. So now you're looking at a transverse view, and a circle that's becoming an ellipse is collapsing, right? And a circle that's not becoming an ellipse isn't collapsing. I don't know why you're not writing that down. But, um, so, so, the, uh, so anyway, that's, that's one way to tell the difference, okay? So we've got now information about contractility, and we've got information about the inferior vena cava, and the final piece, and as uh, you know, lung ultrasound enthusiasts uh, would, would say, and certainly Dan Lichtenstein, who's the French intensivist that really is the, the grandfather of lung ultrasound, would say, it's the only thing that matters. Why would you care about the heart? Well, because I care about, you know, fluid overload and the patient having respiratory distress, aha, then you really care about the lungs, he would say. But he says it like French, so it sounds cooler. <laughs> so he describes this uh, two-stage process, which I really like. There's a lot of different ways you can approach looking at the lungs. I like this because it's very pragmatic. Start off in the anterior uh, chest wall, and if you see the pathology on both sides, you've got your answer. If you see normal lung in your patient who's in respiratory distress, then you move a little bit further back to zone two, which goes from the anterior axillary line to the posterior axillary line. If you see your pathology, you've made your diagnosis. If you still have normal lungs at this point, looking throughout the anterior and lateral chest wall, zone one and zone two, in your patient who's short of breath, only then do you need to go behind the posterior axillary line to get into zone three. Now, he did it this way because his patients are ICU patients and they're hard to roll around. Um, and we do it this way because our patients are in extremis and they're uncomfortable um, and they're hard to move around as well. So I like this approach, but there's, there are others that are pretty simple. There's the pleura. There's the reflection of the pleura, the first A-line. There's the reflection of the pleura again, the next A-line, okay? So since it's you guys, I can be a little more uh, uh, semantic with you. Every horizontal line you see on lung ultrasound is not an A-line. Technically, the A-lines are just the ones that are the reflections of the pleura. The ultrasound beam bounces down, hits the pleura, goes back to the skin. The first time it does that, the ultrasound machine says, oh, that's pleura, and it's this far away. But then some of the ultrasound energy bounces off the skin and goes back down again because it's kind of reflective, right? It's covered in gel, it's a smooth surface, and there's a density change between the skin and the probe. So it bounces back down again, hits the pleura a second time, bounces back again. So the machine thinks, well, so there's pleura again and twice as far away, and pleura again and three times as far away, okay? So this is 
the sonographic equivalent of what happens with light if you stand in between two mirrors that are parallel to each other, right? And you get that infinite mirror effect, and each of those infinite mirrors that are artifacts of light are the mirror length apart from each other, okay? So if, you're not, if those mirrors aren't parallel, you're not gonna get that. Similarly, if your probe is not, if not, is not parallel to the uh, pleura, meaning perpendicular to the chest wall, then you're not gonna get that artifact. Okay, so if you're doing lung ultrasounds, you're not seeing A-lines, the way you correct that is just fiddle around with your angle until you find your probe perpendicular to the pleura. That means the lungs are dry, okay? The reason why the pleura is such a bright reflector is because there's air behind it. So the pleura is kind of like glass. Depending on what's behind glass, it's either a window or a mirror, okay? If there's air behind glass, it's a mirror. If there's silver spray paint behind glass, it's a mirror. Did I say that right? No, it's, a, it's sorry, we're gonna rewind. Actually, I'm just gonna start for over from the beginning. Um, no, the, um, the, um, the, if there's, if there's uh, spray paint behind uh, glass, it's a mirror. And if there's air behind glass, what is it? A window, see, I, I would say it wrong twice, but you guys knew what I meant, so I'm gonna leave it like that, okay. So depending on what's behind the lung, right, so if there's air behind the pleura, it becomes a mirror. That's why I got confused, because sound works different than light. Um, and if there's liquid behind the pleura, then it acts like a window, and it, it lets the sound waves progress. You start to see stuff uh, like pneumonia back there. We're not talking about that today. If, in contrast, there's a little bit of edema within the interlobular septa, you start to get a different kind of artifact. You start to get a reverberation artifact, sort of like feedback that you would hear acoustically from a stereo system coming from the pleura. So a million little horizontal lines all in a row form what looks to us like a, a vertical line. So B lines are a sign of pulmonary edema in the right clinical context. What else could B lines represent? Could be pneumonia, yeah, what else? Interstitial lung disease, so pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it, it could represent scarring, um, empyema, so some other stuff. Basically, a lot of pathologies could represent that. Uh, sarcoid, but it, uh, but it definitely represents when there's multiple some pathology. And this is the deal why. I love this because how often do emergency physicians show histology slides, right? It makes us look really smart. So here's uh, normal, aerated, very thin-walled alveoli, and the interlobular septa can fill up with fluid when you get pulmonary edema, and the ultrasound beam bouncing back and forth between this little microscopic area is what causes that reverberation artifact, and it's super tiny, which is why it looks like all those lines, right? In contrast to the big perpendicular, um, the big parallel artifact that you get when the um, ultrasound beam is bouncing back and forth between the skin and the pleura to create A-lines, okay? So again, normal alveoli, you get A-lines, pleura, reflection, reflection. When the beam starts bouncing around inside of the interlobular septa, you get B-lines, which are gonna look like vertical lines. All right, so pleura, a-line, A-line, you can get a sense that the next one might be there because you can just extrapolate in your mind when the next one should be. Dry lungs, not decompensated CHF, okay? Getting back to the point of this in, the, in terms of the cardiac ultrasound. How does this one look? B-lines, right? So many B-lines that it almost looks like the entire pleura against what the shadows on the ribs are looking like. The bright white of the pleura is reflected all the way down. So B-lines should be uh, arising at the pleura, they should move with the pleura, they need to extend all the way to the edge of the screen, and they need to obliterate the A-lines. You had a question? Yeah, just a quick, quick question. I think a lot of us are doing our uh, long sounds with the linear probes. All these images you got are cardiac. Yes. So depending on who you ask, the preferred method of approaching which probe to use, which was the question, the, which probe do I use to, to do this, the, um, it, it's kind of hard to argue with the inertia of Daniel Lichtenstein tirelessly promoting the microconvex probe on his Toshiba ultrasound machine that he has had since 1989. Um, and again, it, it's hard to argue with the guy that's published all this, this data, but nobody's using that, right? So, so when there was an international consensus conference uh, on this, and that gentleman there, Jim Sung, was a member of that committee, 
it was determined that you could pretty much use any kind of probe. One of the preferred probes was that microconvex array, because that's what Dan Lichtenstein's, all his early literature and publications are built on this. A lot of people like the, the curvilinear probe, the abdominal probe, because um, it provides a nice balance between seeing a level of detail at the pleura. Like, you should find most pneumonias. The resolution would be high enough to, to see that, um, as well as giving you really nice, long artifacts, okay? Um, so you can see the big picture stuff, because most of the long ultrasound that has to do with A, a lines and B lines and shred sign, et cetera, is, is bigger, better with a bigger picture, um, but it still gives you a high level of resolution. When you really want that highest level, and it'll show you things like lung sliding for pneumothorax, so I, in my opinion, that's, the, that's my favorite probe to use. Um, you can get away with this with the cardiac probe, the phased array probe, as well. You won't get that level of detail on the lung sliding, um, but you'll get... You'll, you'll have B lines and A lines show up pretty nicely. And finally, if you use a linear probe, that's gonna give you the best resolution for lung sliding. It's gonna give you the best resolution for looking at things like pneumonia um, and, and uh, defects of the pleura itself. If your resolution is too high, it may actually um, uh, filter out some of the artifacts that we look for for lung ultrasound. So, um, so the appearance of, of B lines can sometimes be a little more subtle, and you might miss some of them um, in the setting of uh, using a linear probe. Yeah, there, there are, th so, you know, we're, we're limited by what we have access to, right? There are plenty of places where they only have a phased array probe and they've got that primarily for looking at hearts, right? Can you use that to look at lungs? Absolutely. You might remember when we had um, uh, a lot of the internal medicine docs and our medical students were running around with these uh, flip open um, GEV scan devices that had a phased array probe only. So again, that's where we, we look at the heart, the lungs, and the IVC with that, all that one probe. So it's just like the FAST exam, right? When we started doing FAST exam in emergency medicine in the 90s, cardiologists were, were thinking that we were crazy because we were looking at the heart with an abdominal probe in abdomen mode and backwards, right? Um, and then we were like, dude, but it's a trauma. So like, you know, again, different clinical environments are different things, but no, no one designed the abdomen probe to look at the heart, yet we did, and it worked okay, right? So, um, so you can kind of use anything. That was such a long-winded way of saying you can use anything, but you have a world expert here in the audience um, who, uh, who can corroborate that. Yes? Similar thing with our machines, which preset gives us the most artifacts? I feel like lung gives me less artifacts than, than the other presets. We yeah, ideally lung is supposed to be the one that gives you the fewest artifacts. It's going to turn off all the smoothing algorithms, that, the things that make the picture pretty and smooth away those artifacts. Um, but uh, a lot of people would use abdomen mode because um, that works reasonably well also. Again, if, if you were looking at the heart and you were in cardiac mode and then you went around and looked at the lungs, it would work pretty well. So you can kind of get away with it. Ideally, you just want to take off all the bells and whistles. But for the most part, um, I think on our Sonocyte machines, it would be putting the probes in abdomen mode. And on the Zanari machines, we actually have a lung mode. Um, the other thing you can try is pressing the auto gain button on the Zanari machine. And sometimes that will appropriately... Um, change the gain and adjust it so that you'll, you'll get artifact. All right, so what I've just described basically has been described in the literature uh, by Dr. Kimura as uh, the clue exam, okay? Uh, cardiopulmonary limited ultrasound examination. So we're looking at the heart for contractility and effusion. We're looking at the inferior vena cava for its size and its collapsibility. And we're looking at the lungs for A lines and B lines. So Patient on the left who's hypotensive tachycardic has what's going on with their lung? A-line, right? So wet lungs or dry lungs? Dry. How does their cardiac contractility look? Ah, oh, it froze. It was, it was pretty brisk. And um, their IVC down here is really flat. So let me phrase this question in a somewhat scientific way. Will a fluid bolus lead to an increase in cardiac output in this patient? Okay, yeah. When you say things like, do they need fluid or are they fluid overload, or it sometimes is a little fuzzier around the edges. I try to think of it, if I push this button, what's the outcome going to be, right? Because for all of us in this room, I hope uh, fluid will lead to an increase in cardiac output, but it's not clinically relevant, right? So it's not helpful to say, are we dry, or are we wet? It's like, it's, what, what's the outcome going to be in this physiology experiment that is critical care? Uh, what about this patient? Also hypotensive tachycardic. How do their lungs look? Wet, yes, and pretend that's on both sides, right? Uh, how does the contractility look? Hypocontractile, IVC big or small? Is it moving? 
that yeah, wasn't a trick question. It's a still image. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this person is probably past the point where, where giving them fluids alone is going to improve them on their Starling curve. Okay. So again, this is where we put the pieces together. We're calling it cardiac ultrasound. In my opinion, it's hard to separate the clinically relevant kinds of cardiac ultrasound from ultrasounds of the lung and the inferior vena cava. Um, and probably more patients than we think would benefit from this, because the more you do it, the more, the more often you're surprised. All right, so you guys know that there's tutorials and more stuff on our, our website, and, uh, and you know how to find me. So any questions, I think, during the break or something? Or? Uh, there's a panel at the end. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, thank you.